Hi. This time I would like to read a collection of texts as I long abandoned behind since I stopped writing at a certain point in time. So I would like to present the uh, short forms of essays and the uh, short forms that were never included in Occultosophia or any other book. Horns of the Ancients King Stang and you all majestic and reverend. The House of Zoo found their path by choosing the way. Elevating the water, employing the able, they cut along the ink strings, line and never straight. Gopal Suku, Songs of Chu, leaving my troubles, arriving at troubles, Li Thao, verse 161165. I once came across the opinion of a psychiatrist that people in the Panhellenic world lived in a childish fantasy in an infantile stage of a mythological way of thinking. He held the opinion that they were, in a sense, living out mass psychosis. This testifies not only to his complete ignorance of the theological workings of the Ellens, but also to Wingism perspective, that is a reinterpretation of history into a line of understanding that he taught as the best, optimal and unshakable. It is a typical characteristic of small minds to see everything through their own glasses without the ability to change them and focus on other parts of the picture before them. It is sheer intellectual arrogance and the favorite curse of specialization to see only one aspect of things through one's own expertise. Now, truly intelligent people are not only experts, but also general scientists and critical thinkers. They are analytically and systematically able to draw analogies and comparisons between different forms of science, art, information, structures and data and to draw balanced conclusions from them. According to the acumen in process, synthesis, geometry of thought, and synergistic thinking. As in classical rhetoric, it requires invention, composition, arrangement, style, form, and delivery. It is an auto-rhetorical process of ingenuity. Aspiration to seeing is to let go of such preconceptions and perceive from the mind of another. To see the Hellenic mind requires heavy studies in classical reception as well as the ability to understand the corpora of literature embedded in sociocultural and historical network of ideas, behaviors, cognitive emotive as well as pneumatic and metaphysical vantage points. It demands pitching one's own mind for subtly and psyche to the unveiling and bridging the past with the modern day. But the proceed is that cultural paradigms that are brought in metaphysics are possessing a unique, fine-tuned existential decorum. They draw from a rounded world, that is, the world is spherical and ordered as in spherical metaphysics, as in drawing from the outer rims of the unknown through the known towards the societal, group and individual noosphere, or what people have in their mind, pneumosphere, what people report about souls, including peak experiences, rites, ceremonies, initiations, festivals, and so on. To draw from the invisible and to derive order from it is to set certain philosophical standards, certain desired virtues, and masterful techniques to add poetry and beauty derived from a fine world of immortal ideas, a priori. The Lucians that ground the inspiration of atheist words that would cause a quarrel among the philosophers who are whose ways of life, whose ideas and whose virtues are the best. But as long as a quarrel in a common world, a free world, it provokes food for thought and preserves an element of the sacred and necessary profane. Inasmuch as an ancient temple or a bionic statue was a reification of the divine ideas behind them, so the reflection of it within the mind commemorated the signs and symbols of the invisible in the mystic's eyes. When the psychiatrist called mass psychosis of the Ellens was exactly the prerequisite for civilizational health and decorum. What the psychiatrist didn't see is that modern world in postmodern chaos is our foundations or basis for decorum and public health. Let me tell you a recent story that struck me like an illuminative lightning from the brilliant majestic daylight sky. Once upon a time I stirred in the rain puddle and in its, in its waters I stirred at the reflection of the sun. Then I closed my eyes and gazed into the sun with my mind, and I imagined almost seen transcendent realm of divine fire. But with my soul's eyes, I seen the fiery, fierce, unconquerable presence of a magnificent teletarchic world that was neither individual nor a collective, but a unison of wonder, awe, strength, acting well in motion and perfect stillness. It was extremely difficult to express. 
And I stared at the puddle again in which the sun was reflected, and I contemplated my own pneuma in this reflection. Here an image, a mirror, then the deeper I went into introspection, the more I neared this Yaru field, divinity via my soul, erasing all the barriers that hold my semblances, my images, tokens, signs, and symbols. There I stood, full of the world and completely at home, with my soul intelligible to the world and pitched perfectly to its expression, and opera omnia as such. Enclave of Valley, pattern in defense of Arete. The character shows the destiny, the discipline means the behavior. The daimon directs to the epitome of the Arete, because it is to be understood with this high muse. What is the real value of virtue? Is the golden chain of virtue equal to the iron chain of vice, which is internally empty and contains no essential dharmas? It is merely a social construct that is completely relative. What is the value of virtue in the modern world? Aretology deals with such questions. In nihilism, such values are completely overridden. In aspects of the sociology of ignorance, values are mere automatisms inculcated in society by socialization through mentors and peers throughout history and the mutability of the history of ideas in the North Northland. Even if you were to take the wisest man who could bridge the ancient past and modern times and get him with his great historical insight into causality to tell us what is of value, he would not pull the universal laws out of a hat. Aretological instincts depend on stability, wisdom, discernment, and good judgment in every situation and, in, and events forever linked to the human environment and the personal characteristics of the observer of thought, speech, and action. Deriving virtues from observations and internalizing them is reasonable, but is, not it, is it not a struggle against adversity that creates an asylum of values that hardly anyone can relate to? If you pitch your song too high, no one will follow. These were the words of Dufu. Not exactly. It was a different Chinese scholar, but I misattributed it to him. There is not a single man who is coherent, understandable, and rock solid in his insistence to be noble. This is because nobility is forever linked to the set of practiced virtues and the love of great beauty and reverence that transcends the land of men. Most of us may have the image of a knight in the shining armor in our minds, implying that the virtue is devalued in modern times. Rather, imagine an ordinary person who overcomes his weaknesses and endures great turmoil and hardship in order to excel and absorb those hard-won essences of ideas. This is not stupidity, but a deep understanding, a profound essence, a gravity of barely surviving those things, the lightness, subtlety, kindness, and strength and grace outward a resolute diamond carrying the imperial obsidian sword hidden. As a utilitarian aretologist, I consider virtue to be the social logoi unit of a healthy society, just as a family is an anthropological unit. It is the atmospheric node to humanity in its refinement. It is the turn to excellence that is no longer to be found in this world that tries to deceive us by saying such and such was never there. History is always now. Now, as a metaphysician, I find that the gigantomachy of virtues is a process of searching for a key to the divine, the homoiosis tale. What virtues, he asked. The diamond and ethos are different for each man and woman and are ultimately measured by objective transcendent lobes. But we have no direct access to this world. We can derive approximation based on ideas and experience revelations, realizations where wisdom and laws of nature, earth, and men are approached, in the divine land of notions tends to unfold too. Gods do not contradict nature. They further its hypostasis. It is a process of constant interpretation, a hypothetic hermeneian. You have to find the religion. You have to find the ideas. After all, it is a cosmos and not a chaos. As for the nature of the lion, it's a lionessness. It's ding and zif but it is different for each life. What belongs to the nature of man is his humanity, but it is different in every man. Oscillations of bestiality and it will follow, but ultimately this is necessary to distribute what is of use and ipsa benena bibas.
Drink your own poison to heal yourself as if you were taking a spagyric medicine. Don't think of virtue as a boastful thing. I think of impractical fools. Oh, now every thief, scoundrel, and swindler will cry out, loser, a fool. I will use the first attempt to use his cunning and stealing as a proof. This is a society of high-ranking cheats, scoundrels, and thieves that are institutionalized. Only the petty criminals are relegated to the courts and prisons. There is a general social acceptance of many behaviors that are contrary to the interest of a reasonable society. Why should we ever engage in noble enterprises when any thief can rob us of our possessions? Any swindler can slander our reputation and good name. Any scoundrel can plot against us. There remains something of psychological transparency. When you are drawn into these vices, you build a behavioral identity based on the same premises as the adaptive swindler. In fact, you have much to gain in this way, from a purely materialistic point of view. It is smarter to be a great uncaught criminal than a decent human being. From the big picture point of view, it's better to walk towards the tip. But if most people's insight ends at the tip of their nose, what are we talking about? They are like market women, incessantly twittering rubbish, thinking they are engaged in something very, very important. Only people who openly act upon their gigantomachy tower and overarch the rest in practice. The gigantomachy of those in power, of those who rule over people, is greater than that of monks. That is why one so often finds petty crooks in government whose ineptitude is marked by psychopathic self-delusions, lies and the persistent fear that they will be confronted stripped of the trappings, the charm of status, tested, audited, and condemned. A true gigantomachy would tear them to shreds. Now, a magician who fights against perversities, deviations, and vices is in a solitary position, but in a more honest one, because he alone is with the alone, as the Sufi saying goes, with the deserts and the gods. Anarchs make metal and metaphysics in the age of the master of new lives. Measure everything with ethos of golden ages as a reference frame and compare it to the present, stripping off all our habituated falsehoods, and you'll see one age of a monster, a faceless, disgusting mass of filth, a cacophony of wronged minds, quenched hearts, and twisted souls, a rotten puppeteer that seduces more puppets to play on the strings of this ugly spectacle. It is not a Faustian civilization, it is not a Promethean civilization. It is a civilization in which a rotten corpse went vitriolic, while sustained, it looks like a cosmetically fresh living of flesh. Among power politics, you merely have permitted amounts of freedom within the consensual frame. The early spectacle, the panopticon, the no runaways, no geniuses, no liberties. When individuals go beyond that, they are destroyed. It is not moving against the societal order, business as usual. It is discovering covert things and exposing them in broad daylight. That is a threat to power. Yet exposing the mechanism of power is no longer defunging those engaged in it. It leaves the spectacle spectators unimpressed. They are accustomed to the spectacle and do nothing about it. It is a dangerous sphere in which networks of true and valid information are drowned in a bog of paranoid factoids, personal delusions, systems of false opinions, disinformation, infotainment, misinformation, under education. How can you differentiate, discern, when opinion, not reason, preference, not education, wireism, not commitment, egotism, not responsibility, are entroned? Go beyond that and you find yourself on unsafe ground in which no one trusts another. The delusional system of a society is seen as a norm. Cry out and you'll be taken for another loony. There are plenty loonies already. You're just another one. If you don't understand the power games, you are a mere doubler, a worm that meddles in things. Permitted amounts of unclothed dissidency are a mere token of appreciation for hapless victims. You won't be a political target if you are blind. You are not a threat if you don't undermine the status quo. Otherwise, if you know the mechanics and guts of power, who's who, who's who's controller, who's who's network, who's on whose payroll, who's what's wealth, who is whose, who you know. Then you have potential threats because you know. If you act upon that, you draw attention. If you draw attention, you bought in, pacified, discredited, or kill. You are all subject to power because you play the societal game of delusion. 
try to cast the yoke off your clash with petty officers of power politics. Every state, every government was about transactions of power and with society's war to resource. Liberties were granted based on the share in power and slavery based on lack of holding such. The grand game that power upholds is based on sub-transactions of illusions and abstracts. When you convince a precariat that he is rich, satisfied, comfortable, or another person that he is effective while he plays in disenfranchised virtualities, he constitutes a perfect slave, a living advertisement of power. His life, like his grave, are meaningless. The most numerous is the family of the grave. It is all about creating and selling dreams. Those who have no power to depose governments are already subservient to this power, as it bites deeper in easy, warm flesh. As long as you preserve your freedom, it doesn't concern you. Enjoy the spectacle. When your mind, body, heart, and soul will become infiltrated and enslaved, you will recognize your yoke. And it already was. If you understand it, very long. If you can't get power over human minds, hearts, and souls, you are a mere statistical event in the curse of history. Try and understand that. Maybe that's what you want to be. There's no fault in that. There's another point, that of ideas, that of ethos, another escape route, and that is that of resilience to the pigs of power of the modern day, that of knowledge and act, that of dissidence and engagement. Those that are remembered by the gods are not the pigs of power, but those who prove themselves wielders of their ethos, whether they possess power or not. There is no excuse of disengagement other than that of inability. Carry on. Ariadne severed her thread, and its metaphysics as the last stand. A logoi of a society, a civilization, a culture, is similar to paradigm and science. It is an interwoven set of theories and praxis that together constitute a paideic order. Paradigms and science change more often than the logo of a culture, and the continuity and coherence of a society depends on the latter. An example may be a dance called Hormos, performed by girls and boys together in ancient Greece. The dance resembled a string of beads. Boys' steps were later used in battle. Girls' steps had more decorum, but the whole dance was woven into a meaningful whole that encircled projected fates of life and death. Each bed was a cultural unit of some kind that was interconnected with the rest of the patterned whole of the culture, education and ethos of a given society. It is not possible to create such a structure synthetically. It grows organic organically like a garden of many beautiful green areas over time and is known as tradition, a concept called Li in ancient China would suit the purpose. Every destruction of such pattern is damaging the delicate entropy of the organized whole and leads to a devastating disease of the mind, heart, and soul. No longer is their foremost performed, and no longer it is necessary. In the age of dying logos, when even the most resilient Eastern schools are corrupted and destroyed by the onslaught of postmodern Tartarism, the beds, the patterns, and the orders are thrown into disarray. Some attempt to rush to collect the beds from the jaws of the crawling time and weave their own, but by and by it is a personal endeavor, that of a metaphysical anarch. Civilizationally generated mental diseases follow these splinters of the Noosphere into chaotically warring factions. If we should even care, all our moves are strangled by the modus operandi of the current state of affairs. Yet we are all in need of coordinates, something referentially still, so each faction invents itself into one or another personality cult of mongrels, Deluded pockets of belief systems, one or another political system, that weave their own tale of ignoramuses, enchanting the masses with their flawed and misfired projections, generated in castles of illusions built on the cadavers of the mob that is in love with the grand effect of the construction from their corpses. It is a civilization that is lost in a labyrinth, seeking or running away from the Minotaur, but he is nowhere to be found. He long abandoned the maze. It is a civilization that cut the Ariadne's thread because it knew better, believing that severing the past vector and replacing it with provenance, not technological progress, but social logia devaluation, will liberate. It enslaved it, just like Judeo Christianity enslaved and captured the human spirit of high antique. So modernity abolished the pretense of Judeo Christianity that paved the way to a theology of nihilism, through its illogical doctrinary stiffness. 
to ethics and morality and replaced with the relativist biotechnical informational chaosmos, at least in the US. From perspective of god making, heroization or redeification, from the perspective of pneumatology, it is a tragedy. Biomass deprived of soul or ignorant of ascension rituals makes perfect slaves, because when you take the liberty away, it has nowhere to turn to, apart from the hands that feed its living corpse. Ultimately, even psychologically speaking, ultimate reference of one's own godhood makes us indestructible. When it is enfleshed in reality, it makes us gods. One may argue that blind ideology and religious extremism work in the same way, a little still play in the dirt of fundamentalists, but emerge subtle and strong, moderate and perseverant. Duration is the key word here. It is not love or compassion that should be extended, their own fumes, but personal responsibility and commitment that should be taught. We can't reconstruct what is lost, but at least we may try to extend the lever, like Archimedes, to make the task easier and lift more with less effort.